welcome to my podcast the journey of a researcher and today i'm really excited because i have a very very close friend of mine uh, doing an episode with me his name is dr matharishwan nagan babu right <laughs> yep. and uh, he and i have known each other for more than 8 years we met first in i 10 Yes, he corrects me. <laughs> yep. See, I told you it's more than eight years. So I'm kind of right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, we met during uh, his visit to Iser Mohali, and uh, it just was the best scientific f- friendship that happened. We bond on a lot of things. One thing we truly are passionate about is science, and. all think about science just not the research but everything about it he is also going to start his own podcast scientific entrepreneurs which i am very excited about and i will ask him to introduce himself cool thank you gosuri for the nice introduction um as she mentioned i'm mata nagan babu uh, i go by mata i don't use my full long indian name Uh, I'm a scientist by training and a consultant by profession. Uh, I have a PhD in chemistry, and I've worked as a healthcare consultant with a company called Boston Strategic Partners, based out of Boston, um, here in the U.S. So, uh, Mata is on the other side of the scientific community. I really don't understand a lot of the consultancy stuff. That's why I really wanted him to be in this episode because I was like. tell me what you do cuz i need to know what you do and uh, that's exactly the plan of this episode he is going to talk about his journey and the job he's doing right now and how he uses the same scientific training that i have but in his career field and it's very exciting cuz i have very limited idea and i know a lot of you don't as well so let's start with the basics so could you give me a quick you know intro to your educational background sure um i was trained mostly as a chemist uh, i did my integrated masters in chemistry from india from pondicherry university and then i did my phd in chemistry from carnegie mellon university and thereafter i did another i stuck to chemistry i did a postdoc in sort of neuroscience uh, at uc berkeley and then i decided okay There's enough chemistry in my life. I want to do some biology, and then I moved on to uh, Oregon Health and Science University. I did a brief four or five month molecular biology postdoc just to get a hang of mm-hmm. how biology works. I never really intended to be a biologist because mm-hmm. I think that will be another ten year training process. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so I just wanted to get to know how biology works, how I can speak to biologists as a chemist. Mm-hmm. So that is my training. Well, wow. yeah, uh he has a very diverse uh background and we're going to touch a little bit on that uh going in. So, very general question. You know what my podcast is about? It's the journey about a researcher. So, my very important question, mm-hmm. would you call yourself a researcher? I'm definitely a researcher by heart and by researcher I just don't mean that people who do bench science only. because i keep i mean even if you are a phd student or a postdoc you do bench science you read a lot about papers you think a lot about science so i do two out of those three aspects of science i read a lot about papers and i think a lot about science and i'm very much engaged in the community or with the community uh by twitter i like and retweet and learn about biomedical new biomedical technologies and diseases that are close to my heart in fact uh, i'm learning a lot of biology on twitter than i've ever done in my phd lab or in my postdoctoral experiences yeah uh, i definitely agree that social media has uh, affected how now we talk about science it's no more about just reading it on a scientific website or journal it's also what's going coming up really fast and a lot of it is when labs share about their work so i agree with you so a follow up question will be if you have to say this is why i was associated with research or i'm still also like what it means to you well research to me just means tangible outcomes and by tangible outcomes 
I crave for impact. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the reasons I got into chemistry was because I thought I can make small molecule drugs for diseases. I mean, of course, the world is changing these days and there's all kinds of biotechnology and biology involved. So that's what is science to me. Impact, tangible outcomes, how many people are you helping and how is it changing lives in a good way? A lot of others have a different approach. They are driven mm-hmm. by curiosity and learning. I, I do respect that, but mm-hmm. that's just not me. Yeah, yeah. I definitely agree with you on that, that everybody have their own purpose, their own reason to come into research. Some of it is personal. There are altruistic reasons and stuff like that. But I feel like we all definitely share a common goal of doing something that will better the society in some way, like somehow our work should help the society move forward or solve the current problem there is. So how you do it, how you come to it, it's like your own personal thing, but I think that's the overarching goal in our all of our lives. How has been your journey so far? Oh my God. Okay. That's a very tough question, <laughs> but the answer is it has been a very tough journey for me. Mm -hmm. Um, It started with the fact that I did not have enough undergrad research experience. And that is a baggage that I carried all along. Um, I had to catch up as a PhD student to the international standards. Obviously, Carnegie Mellon University Mm -hmm. is a university of repute. So I had to like be up to the mark. And I accomplished that because I had a wonderful PhD advisor whom I called mentor not Mm -hmm. just an advisor. Mm -hmm. And I also had great colleagues. Mm -hmm. So they were very supportive in every failure of mine and they encouraged me to build on my own strengths. But my postdoctoral journey was not quite smooth as expected. One, I had moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. So I sort of did not have many friends and Mm -hmm. I was dealing with my own mental issues. As I said, not many friends, so lack of a support system, mentors, all of those affected my performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is one reason I decided to quit science. Uh, I still love doing science. As I said, I will probably continue being part of the scientific community for, for life. But I just can't deal with the day-to-day failures associated with bench science. And that's absolutely perfect. I feel like if everybody did bench-to-bench science, a lot of industries will fall because there are so many things that goes on, consultancy will fall. That's what makes me very curious and also was one of the reasons why I started this podcast is to connect with people who are not just doing bench sciences, but they are also PhD. You have uh, definitely explained how your PhD experience won. If there was something like you hoped happened a little bit differently, looking back that, okay, if this thing probably would not have happened or would have happened, maybe my uh, experience would be a little bit different. Yeah. As I mentioned previously, I just want to reemphasize that I I had a great PhD experience. Mm -hmm. It was tough, but it was great. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful mentor and supportive colleagues, but I wish... As I said again earlier, Mm -hmm. I had more undergrad experience. So as soon as I got into grad school, I could have just ran the race, you know, instead Mm -hmm. of trying to run the race. Mm -hmm. Uh, That would have given me enough thrust to finish projects in a shorter time. Even if projects failed, which invariably happens, I would have learned to sort of cope up with them and pivot the projects and publish more papers. Mm -hmm. Remember, we do live in a publish or perish environment, regardless of whatever people want an ideal world to be. Yeah, There are two things that I've learned from my PhD advisor. One is do not micromanage people at all. If they are passionate, they will do it. I've worked 60, 70 hours in my PhD and my advisor did not care. He just cared for outcomes. And the other thing is just be confident at all times. I've seen people who, you know, have not had a lot of great publishing history, but just because they are confident, they've gone and accomplished a lot of things. Yep. I will absolutely agree with the whole uh, publication aspect, because even though I have some publication, I still feel like a lot of times that I don't have enough. 
or maybe if I at least need like this number of paper to apply for a fellowship or to apply for a grant or something like that. And sometimes you need those things to make a case for yourself, but how you present yourself during interviews or how you present your talk to a panel also affects whether they really like you or not. That is true because to get to an interview, all that people want to hear is from your advisor's recommendation letter. Mm -hmm. And if you've done well in the lab, even though your projects have failed, Mm -hmm. if you have a scientific thinking process, your advisor is sure to give a good recommendation letter. Now, once you're in the interview process, you're obviously going to talk science. You've done it for five or six years or seven years. The one critical thing that's going to get you the job is how you distinguish yourself from the other candidate who also might have a good recommendation letter and knows what he's talking. So that's where confidence plays an important role. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like how we needed like our GRE and TOEFL score to get into the application pool. And then (laughs) our SOP was the make and break deal. That is true. Yep. (laughs) So going back to uh, your PhD time, there was something you did additionally. It was not an MBA course, right? It was uh, mostly like entrepreneurship, biomedical something. So A, please explain that. Uh, What was that? And B was, uh, why did you choose to take an extra challenge while doing your PhD? Uh, You're right. I did not do an MBA program, but I did about four MBA level courses as a part of the James R. Schwartz Entrepreneurial Fellowship. This is a venture capitalist partner based in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he's from Carnegie Mellon University. And he wanted to encourage students with entrepreneurial thinking to go out, like take more business courses and go to the Bay Area and meet with people. So it is a very engaging and intense course. Uh, As I said, I did four courses as in a year. And I also had to travel a lot to the Bay Area to meet with entrepreneurs and other people to sort of network and see what I could do using my own science and go forward. Mm -hmm. Um, I did try working on a project. Um, It was more to do with detecting inflammation using fluorescence. But after doing some preliminary analysis and market research and things like that, we realized that there was a big player out there who was building a chip-based technology, obviously chips are much cheaper compared to fluorescence or light technology. So I had to let go of that entrepreneurial thought, but I still harbor those thoughts and the fellowship definitely helped me. Mm -hmm. In terms of why did I take an additional burden as a part of my PhD, as I mentioned to me, research was about tangible outcomes. And this was a great opportunity for me. It just came up and my PhD advisor encouraged me to apply. I applied, got in and did everything. One of the things or many of the things that happened in that time period was a lot of support from my PhD advisor and colleagues. Um, I had a couple of undergrads working for me back then. I was able to work 40 hours in the lab and the remaining whatever hours towards my business program. And life there was completely different. It's not like Mm -hmm. what you do in research. It's much more. And that's one thing I've learned, that life is much more than research and bench science. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a whole lot to it. You can do a lot. You can make a tangible contribution to the society, Mm -hmm. not just by science, but doing a lot of other things. But you need a tool to make that contribution. And for me, that tool was science. So that's what I realized. It also taught me how I can leverage my scientific background to not be a bench scientist. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, doesn't make sense. (laughs) Um, uh, Or what other avenues I can leverage my science with. Uh, Mm -hmm. It taught me that I could be a consultant, an investment banker, or an entrepreneur itself, and a lot of other things. Things I know, like I don't know, but now I know. Okay, interesting. (laughs) I I can give you one minute introduction, unless yeah. you think the answer was already long. Well, here's the thing. Banks want money and mm-hmm. they want smart people to do investments on their behalf. Mm-hmm. People with MBA are going to do all the financial analysis and things, but there is a value in the financial statements that is important. It's called the growth factor of a company. Okay. And an MBA person cannot determine the growth of a biopharma company because he cannot read 
clinical papers or he cannot understand clinical trial research and things like that. That is where a biologist or a chemist comes into picture. So wow. that person is going to judge how successful a particular drug or a technology is going to be and communicate it to the MBA team. And they are going to then make investment decisions based on that. Wow, this is perfect because I'm learning so much. So mm -hmm. uh, that brings up a very important part of your life right now, which is your experience as a consultant. So I will ask you to first give a very brief introduction to what being a consultant means. Like, you know. Yeah, so let me broadly define what a consultant means and why I am a consultant, and then I'll go into the details. Mm -hmm. So As you probably know, a consultant is someone who is consulted because of the expertise in a field of, in a field or multiple fields. Uh, I'm a consultant primarily because I can talk, read, and draw insights from scientific literature. As I mentioned in the case of investment bankers, I do pretty much the same thing, except that I work a little less hours than an investment banker. <laughs> Are so, you complaining about that? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> We also help companies in a lot of other ways. So I've worked on projects anywhere ranging from, should we go and do clinical trials for this drug? To, oh, how should the clinical trials look? Where should they be conducted? Um, who are the physicians that we need to contact or recruit for the trial? To, oh, this drug has been approved by the FDA and we want to launch it soon. But we want to build communication materials for the physicians who are the people who are going to prescribe the drug. Oh. Like, so I've done posters, I've written white papers and things like that. Basically, if there is a, a drug A, they come mm -hmm. to you and they first of all ask you whether you will go yay or nay with this drug. Like uh, they give drug you, candidate, yes. Yeah, the candidate. Like, yep. So if it's a yay, then how you should go about it, how big the trial needs to be, and then all the other yep, yep. protocol of that. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, uh, the good thing is you don't follow one particular drug. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just spent one year in my company, and mm -hmm. there's no way I would have worked on three different uh, drugs through their entire mm -hmm. life cycle. I've mm -hmm. worked on them in different stages of the life cycle. Okay. Okay. So based on where they thought, okay, this is where I need Mata's mm -hmm perception and like viewpoint and critical mindset that's when they be like hey look at this yes LS. bsp's viewpoint and i'm a part of bsp so i kind of get why did you choose to become a consultant based on how your experiences have been both in the science world as well as your uh, experience in the entrepreneurship course but the thing is how did you pursue this career because you know We all know that once you become a PhD, it's not like a campusing scenario That's or true. opportunity cell that happens at undergrad level, irrespective of which country it is. Mm -hmm. yep. It's universal. That's, that is a very relevant question. And this might actually be applicable to a lot of folks in India too, who might be mm -hmm. your uh, listeners. Okay. So... The first thing you have to do is to, as I mentioned, you know your science, but if you want to be a consultant, you need to show that you are interested in business. A lot of the folks that I know of um, go work in their tech transfer office, sort of doing very much the same things that I did, but for technology that is coming out of that university. Uh, I did something slightly different. Um, I worked, I tried to create my own startup. Um, I worked with my advisor's startup for a summer. You can also do that. These things tell, you know, you can put them on your resume and it just tells the person screening your resume that you are interested in business side of science. Now, once you've gotten to that stage, the interviews are something completely different. They're going to be on something called case practices mm -hmm. or consulting cases, uh, which is really answering market relevant healthcare questions. For example, you yep. worked on pancreatic cancer. Yep. So they might ask you, what is the market size of pancreatic cancer? Now imagine pancreatic cancer is not a big market and there are already 10 competitors in there. What is the point in you getting into a market 
as the 11th competitor mm-hmm. where you're going to provide an incremental value to the patient. Mm-hmm. And most of the patients are very much happy with the 10 competitors already. Oh, okay. So that's something you got to find out. And there are very standard cases that are available online. You can look it up. Okay. And these are the kinds of questions they answer. Another non-market size or disease question would be, oh, a big pharma company wants to acquire a cancer therapeutic startup. Mm-hmm. One of them does CAR T therapy. One of them does a small molecule drug. Which one would you pursue? Which one would you acquire? So obviously you're an immuno immunologist. So you might not know about the company, but you no. use your background, uh, not just in immunology. I also can mm-hmm. do it. Uh, read about it and then figure out what is the value that's being provided yeah. to the patients. And based on that, you can then go and present this data to the company, the client, and they're going to make their own decisions based on that. One of the challenges a lot of PhD students like us have is building the resume for sure. something that's not academic. Mm-hmm. Consultancy interview is definitely not an academic interview position. So when you had to move around your CV to fit this resume two-page structure for your job application, what were your challenges? That's an appropriate question to ask. I wouldn't say I had a lot of challenges, but I would say it was tough to build a very solid resume. Now, as I mentioned, people can work in the tech transfer office. They can work in startups. They can do a lot of things. But beyond all of that, they need to have a passion to do one or the other thing. Mm -hmm. I applied to three scientist positions in my uh, tenure of post-undergrad scientific journey because I did not want to be a bench scientist Mm -hmm. at all. And the three positions that came up were very close to what I was doing in my PhD. So I thought, okay, I'll just give it a shot. So that's one thing. First, identify what you're passionate about. If you want to go into consulting, do it. Probably spend six months practicing, but you have to work on other things. If you want to be a bench scientist, do good bench science and start applying that way. Mm -hmm. Learn a lot of skills, right? Uh, That's true for any role that you apply. Now, how do you know what skills you want, whether it is being a scientist or a consultant or an investment banker? Mm-hmm. The best way is to talk to people who are already doing the job. It serves two purposes. One, you might have a very rosy picture of what they do or even a very bad picture of what they do. It'll give you a more realistic picture if you talk to them. Yep. Second, not everyone goes to MIT and Harvard. So for people like them, it opens up an opportunity to build relationships with people who are in the Boston area or in the San Francisco area, because those are sort of seen as the hubs of where science thrives. Okay. So it opens doors to connect with people in those areas. And there's a lot of networking events that happen on a very day-to-day basis. So it's just easier for people in that area to go meet folks and things like that, which you might not be able to do. So yeah. networking is the second important thing. The third important thing is just be confident and think that you will get the job. Um, I'm not going to be hesitant to say this. I interviewed at 18 firms and I got a job in one firm. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for you, for your confidence levels to plummet. Mm -hmm. But your job rejection, most of the times, has nothing to do with you if you've done a good job. Like I interviewed at a company where they took six people all through the US, they had to make a choice. We are like 200 people interviewing, so they, they had to make a choice. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with me. So you have to understand that. So if I were to sum this up from a long conversation, yeah. build your resume, do things, talk to people, network. And third, just be confident and have a can do attitude. Absolutely. Just do it. I think that's a very. Uh, I'm not promoting Nike. (laughs) No, we are not promoting Nike, but I am saying that's a very relevant quote. Just do it. If you feel like this is something you may be passionate about, just take the chance. Just take that risk. Because if nothing else, it will be an experience and you will realize it's not your place. You have something better to do rather than being stuck in a safe space. I feel like, but you know, everybody has their own reason. We are not telling you to quit your jobs. Okay. We're just saying, if you like something, try to get a more 
detailed idea about talk to people linkedin is an absolute fantastic place to connect to people and just ask question hey what do you do what's your work about whether you like it or not and i think you will also agree like yeah i do and i think you might have to pay to message someone on linkedin mm-hmm. but i think twitter is a free yeah. platform where you can connect with people i mean generally it might not be the person you're looking for that's on linkedin or twitter but there is always someone who can whom you can reach out to and they can connect you with the right people um i have one quick question you know you are an international person just like uh-huh. me and one of the fear a lot of international students have is that because we don't have green card we should not apply to companies because they might not sponsor h1b or they might not be just interested to interview us so i'm pretty sure you probably had those thoughts also how was your experience regarding that big doubt well i did have those thoughts but as i said going to the business school changed a lot of my thoughts so i just applied and figured it out three of the companies that i applied to told me out right that they are not taking international people i went on site to one company founded and there's a lot of international people in that company i'm not going to take names yeah sure uh, they told me that but how would you know whether they take international or not you cannot sit in your own lab and make judgments you have mm-hmm. to talk to people you have to find that out in the interview process uh to me just going to the interview process was a fun thing yeah um, generally um if you're interviewing with consulting companies they fly you in an amazing uh flight uh, and then you're in a good hotel and it's amazing yeah 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 uh, there is this quote right it's either a lesson or a victory like something like that like anything you do you either earn from it or you learn from it yep so yep. that's right so you and, definitely earned and learned a lot <laughs> <laughs> yep and the other thing is i think generally companies are open to sponsoring the right candidates mm mm-hmm. um so i don't see any reason why unless they have limitations where they have a lot of money from dod mm-hmm. or darpa which really restricts them to not take people hire someone yeah and i actually applied to a cosmetic company and they did not even take my resume they were like oops you are international so we are not going to take you i'm like what are you guys doing that you are not going to take me <laughs> and then they mentioned that they were closely with darpa and dod so um even i have those thoughts honestly speaking and a lot of time as you said like if you don't ask the people if you don't apply for the job you never know whether they are really interested in you or not and based on what you're telling like your experience have been i definitely get this vibe is that if you are the right candidate mm-hmm. and you come to the interview with that confidence that i know what i do and i'm confident with what i do and i can like contribute to your company even the other side the interviewing side or the company is more interested to take you they want to take that risk because they are like you are a good investment we want That's, you in the company and i'm a big proponent of startups so mm-hmm. talk to a lot of startups they want people i mean you may not get the same pay as a big company pays yeah. you but end of the day you will have some work experience in a company mm-hmm. rather than basic research and you can learn a lot from that yeah phd or postdocs have another advantage you don't necessarily have to stick to the h1b route one you have 3 years of opt and the second thing is if you have a good scientific profile you can also apply for an o1 visa so an o1 is similar to an eb1 but it just is for 3 years instead of a eb1 green card and it's processed in 2 weeks so that's there too now you guys know there is o1 visa as well not just the h1b it, it's it's good to know that there are other options because i think mostly we talk about opt and h1b so thanks yeah. for bringing the o1 visa so i mean i will look into that yeah i mean what will someone who's finishing up their 3 year opt in march do mm-hmm. the h1b application deadline is april 1st or march 31st they have to do an o1 as scientists we do have that advantage overall all in all from your undergrad to your phd to your consultancy can you sum up your experience uh my experience has been great um at every 
step of the process, be it in my undergrad or in my grad school or in my postdoc, I've always learned and moved forward. And as I said, my goal was to get make tangible outcomes. And I reached that sort of pinnacle, if you want to say, in my consulting job. And I worked in multiple disease areas, uh, neurology, dermatology, urology, cardiology, and even pressure ulcers. And that makes me the happiest person in the world because as a chemist, I'm not just making some small chemical entity, which could be a drug or may not be a successful drug, but I'm just helping people mm-hmm. <laughs> who've made these drugs um, and give them insights and take them into the market. So lastly, yeah, I want you to give some advice to the students who are curious about research field, feel like it's, there's only one way to go. So you just motivate them, something, anything that you have to say to them. Sure. One thing that I've learned in my own journey is reading science and learning science or even enjoying science is not the same thing as doing it. Doing science and dealing with the day-to-day failures or the slow progress even uh, requires a different mental setup. So if you got an A grade in organic chemistry or immunology, go to organic chemistry in the lab or go to immunology in the lab or go to neuroscience in the lab. You can read a thousand page book, which is how big I think our books are (laughs) in like one month and you can master it. But getting a neuronal cell culture running or isolating T cells or, you know, even getting an asymmetric, forget asymmetric, a simple aldol reaction to go is very difficult or it could be difficult. not saying it is difficult. So just go do it, try it out. Second thing I would say is do it with multiple people in multiple labs. Undergrad is the best time you can experiment. I wish I worked in five out of the five summers that I had. Uh, I worked in three out of the five summers, but I did just organic chemistry. I wish I had done other things. So go to a lot of internships in different fields. If you're a chemist, do it in organic, inorganic, um, physical, even in biology or even in computer science. I mean, there's computational chemistry as well. Or if you're a biologist, do it in different fields, neuroscience, immunology, molecular biology, cell biology, whatever you want. And third thing is network a lot. You might have an undergrad advisor. You might have a PhD advisor. You might have great friends. But apart from all these people, have a special set of mentors. These are people who should be able to tell you that you're bad, which your PhD advisor or undergrad advisor or even your friends will not mostly tell you. And these are also people whom, with whom you should be able to vent your frustration out. Whether your research is going bad or you know, anything, you're getting bad grades or anything, or even if your personal issues, how they are clouding your professional experience. You should be able to talk to them and they can, they should be able to provide you insights. And typically, I would say, choose people who are a couple more years senior to you, not who's just one year or two years senior to you, because they just passed this phase. So they, they will try to tell you good things, but they might not know the best things out there. They might know one solution. They might not know. Hey, we worked out just fine. <laughs> sure. <thank you. laughs> yeah. So I think I'd say these three things will put you on the trajectory for success. Yes, definitely networking. I am also realizing this as more and more years are being spent in this field. But uh, you can also have your close friend in your age group too. Just saying. <laughs> but definitely if you need someone who have experienced the field that you're interested in or just curious about, having someone senior from that field helps a lot because they don't have anything to hide. They just tell you as is. And sometimes you don't want to hear it, but it's good that they tell you as is. Uh, Well, that was... Uh, I want to tell one last thing about networking. I was... I mean, as an international student and a non-native speaker or whatever, I was a little mm-hmm. bit shy about asking people out on coffee or talking over the phone. Um, it was actually my undergrad who pointed out that I should ask this one person out on coffee for professional reasons, nothing personal. And 
I took a risk. I wrote that email and the, I met with that person in the next couple of days and we've been good friends ever since. Uh, I mean, this person also has also been helping me professionally a lot. So there's nothing to lose. So just be bold and do whatever you want. Have to. Just don't be abusive or things like that. <laughs> no. Just be nice to the other person or yeah. don't be demanding as well. I mean, people mm-hmm. have a lot of things going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, having a support system and having a safe space is really important, irrespective of which profession you are in. And uh, yeah, if you don't have that thing, things can be challenging. Life is always challenging, but with a good support system, you just deal with it. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so that was the most professional interview we ever did as friends because most of the time we will just talk about things in a very informal, you know, friend setup. But I really enjoyed doing this episode with you, Martha, because you have been very, very articulate with things, especially your experience and people, students, even postdocs who have been doing their stuff for years. If you are interested in consultancy, definitely look into it. I think you've done a fantastic job in giving a brief idea about what the field is, how you approached it, and what you're doing right now. So thank you for coming on my episode. It's been yeah. amazing. Thank you for hosting me. And it's been wonderful talking to you, as you said, professionally. <laughs> um, I hope we talk more professionally. <laughs> yes, yes. Let, let's hope that maybe one day I'll be on the drug end and you will be on the investment end and we will <laughs> discover Saudi. I can always dream about that, right? We can yeah, always and dream if, about that. If people want to reach out to me, you can just look up my name and I think there's a contact information on my website. I'm on Twitter. You can just tweet me and I'm happy to help. Yeah, I will put your website on my episode description so anybody who wants to contact him ask him any question he is really good in replying and he helps the most he can and i can vouch for that Uh, it has been amazing well i will see you guys in the next episode so i'll talk to you later and i'll see you guys the next time